Hyponatremia is defined as a serum sodium level of less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. This means that compared to the body's desired sodium concentration in the blood, the actual sodium concentration is lower. In this video, I'll begin by comparing and contrasting hyponatremia and hypernatremia. Then I'll review hyponatremia's pathophysiology and etiologies, and I'll make a part two about consequences and treatment. If you haven't already, it may be worth watching my lecture on hypernatremia. In that video, I discuss the basic principles underlying fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. I explained how water exists inside the cells, also known as the intracellular space, as well as outside the cells in the extracellular space, which includes the blood plasma and the interstitial fluid that surrounds and bathes the cells in tissues. Additionally, I showed how the body has a desired concentration for the fluid in the intracellular space and extracellular space, how that concentration is determined by the amount of water and solute present, with solute including electrolytes like sodium and potassium, how any deviation from that concentration is met with a shift of water from the area of low solute concentration to the area of high solute concentration, and how there are protective mechanisms in place to prevent an undesirable fluid concentration from persisting, including thirst and the hormone arginine vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone. With hypernatremia, which I defined as a serum sodium level greater than 145 milliequivalents per liter, water was pulled out of the cells, causing them to shrink. The protective mechanisms faltered, whether that was from an inability to satisfy the demand for more water, or an inability of the body to produce or respond to arginine vasopressin, whose function is to enhance water reabsorption. Although it's not an accurate depiction on all levels, I think it is helpful to start by thinking of hyponatremia as a juxtaposition to hypernatremia. The low sodium concentration in the extracellular fluid sends water into the cells, causing them to swell. Then, instead of there being inadequate water replacement, there's too much water available, and the overactivity of arginine vasopressin often causes this. So, there are fundamental characteristics that make these conditions very different from each other. Nevertheless, as we go through hyponatremia, we'll also see there are some similarities. Both can be classified as acute or chronic, with 48 hours as the time frame used for delineation. The brain undergoes an adaptive process in chronic cases that lowers the risk of consequences but makes treatment more complicated, and the consequences are primarily neurological with the most severe cases resulting in seizures, neurological damage, or death. I'll continue to allude to similarities and differences throughout the lesson, particularly when we get to consequences and treatment. But for now, let's focus on today's topic. Since hyponatremia is defined by a serum sodium level that's below the normal concentration, it suggests there's dilution of the blood plasma. Dilution is the process of decreasing the concentration of a solution. Therefore, hyponatremia can develop with a decreased ability of the kidneys to excrete water, excessive water intake to the point it exceeds the kidneys' ability to filter it, or any sodium loss that outpaces water loss. The most common pathological change is the decreased ability of the kidneys to excrete water, it can happen for several reasons, but as I mentioned before, it's most often due to the overactivity of arginine vasopressin. As we transition into etiologies, you'll have the opportunity to see the various instances of that overactivity and why it happens. Many publications that cover the etiologies of hyponatremia share two features. First, they acknowledge the vast number of etiologies and how they cannot cover all of them. Second, they classify the etiologies as hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. 
After trying different ways of presenting this topic, I decided that the same approach made the most sense for organizing the information. Thus, here is your disclaimer that not every possible etiology is covered, though I will highlight those you are most likely to encounter. I'll also classify the etiologies as hypertonic, hypotonic, and isotonic. The suffix tonic refers to the blood plasma concentration compared to what it should be. Hypertonic hyponatremia is when there's hyponatremia while the overall concentration of the blood plasma is higher than what it should be. Hypotonic hyponatremia is when there's hyponatremia while the overall concentration of the blood plasma is lower than it should be. And isotonic hyponatremia occurs when the overall concentration of the blood plasma remains at a homeostatic level. Hypotonic hyponatremia is the most common. Therefore, not only will I spend the most time there, but that is also where I'll begin. Hypotonic hyponatremia is usually further divided into etiologies based on extracellular volume status, and whether it is above, below, or at the expected level. These classification levels become extremely important in treatment because each has unique treatment strategies. Hypervolemic hyponatremia is when there is water and sodium retention, but the water gain outpaces the sodium gain. Hypovolemic hyponatremia is when there's water and sodium depletion, but the sodium losses outpace the water losses. And euvolemic hyponatremia occurs when the total body water increases, but the sodium level remains relatively constant. Examples of hypervolemic hyponatremia include renal failure, heart failure, and cirrhosis. On the one hand, cases related to renal failure happen independent of arginine vasopressin, meaning the development of hyponatremia cannot be attributed to the overactivity of it. Instead, they develop primarily from a low glomerular filtration rate, and therefore, a decline in the nephron's ability to handle the fluid and electrolyte load of the blood plasma. Patients typically face this issue when the GFR dips below 20 to 25 milliliters per minute. Meanwhile, with heart failure and cirrhosis, cases are arginine vasopressin dependent, meaning we can attribute them to the overactivity of it, at least to an extent. In heart failure, the decreased ability of the heart to pump blood leads to the detection of low blood volume by receptors throughout the body. Those receptors stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and arginine vasopressin production, coordinating a response to retain more water and sodium. With cirrhosis, scarring of the liver tissue leads to higher pressure in the hepatic portal vein and the intrahepatic blood vessels. That pressure triggers the production of vasodilators, which have a systemic lowering effect on blood pressure. Ultimately, in the late stages of the disease, those same receptors we saw in heart failure are activated and coordinate the same response, and lead to the retention of sodium and water. In both instances, the body senses low fluid and electrolyte intake or high fluid and electrolyte losses. It holds on to water and sodium even if intake is normal or excessive. Turning to hypovolemic hyponatremia, we have cases attributed to vomiting, diarrhea, sweating, adrenal insufficiency, and diuretics. Vomiting, diarrhea, and sweating are examples of extrarenal losses leading to hyponatremia, like heart failure and cirrhosis, they're considered arginine vasopressin dependent. In my video on hypernatremia, I explained how these body fluids have a lower concentration of electrolytes than the blood plasma. Therefore, significant losses lead to a net water loss, causing the sodium level in the blood to increase. However, there are some instances where electrolyte losses outpace water loss, and hyponatremia ensues. The resulting decrease in blood volume activates the release of arginine vasopressin, and the body holds on to more water. 
that worsens if the rehydration effort adds more water than salt, like a sweaty athlete drinking a large volume of electrolyte-free water at the end of their event. On the contrary, adrenal insufficiency and diuretics are examples of renal losses leading to hyponatremia. While many publications list them under hypovolemic hyponatremia, some list them under euvolemic hyponatremia, and others list them under both. Thus, hyponatremia from these etiologies can present differently. Adrenal insufficiency includes hypocortisolism and hypoaldosteronism. Cortisol inhibits arginine vasopressin secretion, and both cortisol and aldosterone enhance sodium reabsorption. So, a combined deficiency leads to more significant sodium loss than water loss in the urine. However, an isolated cortisol deficiency may lead to water retention without a major change in the body's sodium level, and a patient may appear euvolemic. As a result, the classification of etiologies ends up looking something like this, with hypocortisolism under euvolemic hyponatremia and the combined deficiency under hypovolemic hyponatremia as adrenal insufficiency. In either case, the hyponatremia is considered arginine vasopressin dependent. Then we have diuretics, which includes loop diuretics and thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics are more likely to result in hyponatremia than loop diuretics. Patients can present with hypovolemia or euvolemia, and the hyponatremia typically develops days to weeks after initiating the drug, though in some instances, it develops after months or years. The mechanism for the development of hyponatremia isn't completely understood, but it is almost certainly multifactorial and appears to be related to some combination of genetic predisposition, inhibition of the sodium chloride cotransporter in the distal convoluted tubule, which is responsible for sodium reabsorption, Enhanced expression of aquaporin-2 in the collecting ducts, which are responsible for water reabsorption, and increased thirst leading to excessive water intake. Compared to thiazide diuretics, loop diuretics are far less likely to lead to hyponatremia, but when they do, it's usually hypovolemic hyponatremia due to water and sodium losses. Diuretic-associated hyponatremia gets listed as independent of arginine vasopressin, as well as arginine vasopressin-dependent, across different publications. The testing of arginine vasopressin levels in patients with thiazide-induced hyponatremia has produced conflicting results, so it could be either one. The underlying mechanism for loop diuretics makes the most sense as being arginine vasopressin dependent since the hyponatremia coincides with hypovolemia in the same way vomiting and diarrhea do. Finally, we have euvolemic hyponatremia, which we already saw plays host to cortisol deficiency and thiazide diuretics in some publications. More consistently, this category features the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuresis, or SIAD, excessive water intake, and a low-solute diet. SIAD is the most common cause of hyponatremia. It's defined by arginine vasopressin activity that exceeds what is required to achieve and maintain normal blood plasma concentration whether that's due to excessive secretion or inadequate suppression. SIAD has long been referred to as a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, or SIADH. However, authors and clinicians are phasing it out because it doesn't capture issues related to arginine vasopressin suppression. Common causes of SIAD include malignancy of the brain or lungs, central nervous disorders from stroke or trauma, and pulmonary conditions like pneumonia and respiratory failure. Medications can also increase arginine vasopressin release or potentiate its effects. Examples include narcotics, 
opioids, antidepressants, and antipsychotic medications. Unlike SIAD, excessive water intake and a low-solute diet lead to hyponatremia that is independent of arginine vasopressin. On the one hand, excessive water intake leads to hyponatremia simply by exceeding the kidney's capacity to excrete it promptly despite normal renal function. We see this in psychiatric illnesses, where insatiable thirst occurs even when there is a good hydration status. However, it can also occur in healthy individuals who drink a large volume of water quickly, intending to maintain or improve their health. Conversely, a low-solute diet leads to hyponatremia because the kidneys rely on a certain amount of solute for water excretion. The primary dietary solutes contributing to this activity include sodium, potassium, and protein. If the diet lacks these nutrients, the body cannot excrete the appropriate amount of water. The terms tea and toast diet and beer potomania are often used within this etiology. Tea and toast is usually seen in older adults who gravitate toward a low salt, low protein, and high carbohydrate diet. Beer potomania is seen most often in patients with active alcohol use disorder. The alcohol in beer doesn't contribute to the solute load, and excessive alcohol intake tends to coincide with poor salt and protein intake. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you check out my book, which is now available in my store and on Amazon. I left links for it in the video description and comments section. Now that we've examined the etiologies of hypotonic hyponatremia, it's time to examine hypertonic and isotonic hyponatremia. All of the etiologies in these categories occur independent of arginine vasopressin. Etiologies of hypertonic hyponatremia are often referred to as translocational hyponatremia, and etiologies of isotonic hyponatremia are usually called pseudohyponatremia. A classic example of translocational hyponatremia is hyperglycemia. I covered hyperglycemia in the video on hypernatremia as a condition that leads to dehydration through osmotic diuresis. However, before the water gets excreted in the urine, it sits in the bloodstream and dilutes it. Therefore, it's translocational hyponatremia because it doesn't exist from a change in total body water or sodium. It only exists because the location of the body water changes. In this case, across the cell membrane to the intravascular space. Generally, serum sodium decreases by 1.6 milliequivalents per liter for every 100 milligrams per deciliter of plasma glucose over 100. So a correction can be made in the evaluation of a patient who presents with hyponatremia. Hypertonic hyponatremia can also occur with a recent mannitol infusion before there is significant osmotic diuresis. Lastly, isotonic or pseudohyponatremia occurs when hyponatremia appears on the blood test but isn't actually present. After all, pseudo means false. This can occur when the patient has profound hyperlipidemia or hyperproteinemia, with the latter happening in disease states like multiple myeloma or certain types of lymphoma. These materials don't significantly shift fluid or electrolyte balance, yet they occupy space in the solid portion of the plasma in the blood sample. Thus, when the blood gets analyzed when there's a high level of lipids or protein, the sample's actual amount of water and sodium in the plasma is less than expected, and the sodium level appears low. However, the actual sodium concentration would be normal if the excess cholesterol, triglycerides, or protein were removed. One honorable mention for etiologies that doesn't fit neatly into any of the categories is hypokalemia. 
Hypokalemia can contribute to hyponatremia because a drop in the serum potassium will pull intracellular potassium into the intravascular space in exchange for sodium. So, sodium is lost to the intracellular space, driving the serum sodium level down. With all of the etiologies in mind, you can see how identifying the type of hyponatremia can become incredibly difficult. A patient could easily have renal failure, hyperglycemia, diarrhea, and suspected SIAD from a bacterial pneumonia, or really any combination of the issues listed. In the next video, we'll see the importance of working through these challenges as different etiologies call for different treatment strategies. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you stick around for part 2.